Thank you. All right, let's welcome everyone. Uh, let's welcome our next distinguished speaker, Dr. Don Ingber, who comes to us from the Harvard Medical School and the Wies Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. So Don is a Judah Folkman Professor of Vascular Biology at Harvard Med and uh, Children's Hospital, uh, Children, uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And more importantly, he's the founding director of the Wies Institute, and I hope he'll talk some about the Wies Institute before getting into his research. Don's interests, research interests have spanned multiple areas from mechanotransduction, nanotherapeutics, organs and chips. Uh, he's spun out various companies, the latest being Emulate, about which a lot of us know here through my class as well. So please give a warm Miami welcome to Don Ingber. Thank you very much. I'm glad we got this working. Um, and uh, somebody will control the lights. We could probably have the lights down a little because it's a little hard to see. Uh, looks like everyone left the booth now that we got this working. Um, but uh, Ashu, I'll leave it to you. So anyway, um, uh, so this is out. Uh, our logo at the Wies Institute. Uh, it's one of self-assembly. We were formed uh, in 2009. It was basically me and we hit about 300 people in three years and we're about 375 full-time staff. Um, the story about the Wies Institute, can we keep the lights a little higher than this, Ashu? <laughs> Ashu, can we keep the lights a little higher? Or yeah. if there's no in-between, then leave it. But uh, that, that's, those are the two options? Yeah. Compete. Uh, one of you. What do people see? Can, can people see? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, the story of the Wies Institute, uh, the, the basic concept of it is that bioengineering just transformed medicine over the past 50 years by taking engineering principles, trying to solve medical problems. <laughs> And it's been transformative, hip implants, pacemaker, drug delivery, stents, et cetera. But we feel like we've uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up that we're now at a point where we could leverage biological principles to develop new engineering innovations. This is what we call biologically inspired engineering as opposed to biomedical engineering or bioengineering. Now, we were lucky enough to be kick-started with the single largest gift in Harvard's history at the time of $125 million. And, uh, um, and the, the donor was basically impassioned about trying to develop a way to have near-term impact on the world. And so the, the uh, institute vision, the mission is to transform healthcare and the environment by emulating the way, na well, way nature builds. But we realize that we, breakthrough discoveries cannot change the world if they don't leave the lab. And so we really focus on going from discovery all the way through translation. We have over 40 people with 10, 20, 30 years in industrial experience integrated in. We um, really focus on intellectual property. We have entrepreneurs and residents. So it, it's, it's a novel model. But for today, I'm going to focus on some examples of sort of what we've done. And when we started, that gift basically challenged us to take on, on high-risk, high-impact uh, problems and, and develop disruptive technologies. And the biggest problem that I could see at that time was that the current drug development model is broken. Now, most of you have heard about Moore's Law in the world of computer microchips that computer power doubles every 18 months, has doubled since 1971. This is a log plot. How many of you have heard of Eroom's Law? which is Moore's Law backwards, which is that the number of medicine invented halves every nine years since 1950, even though the funding from government and pharma has gone out through the roof. And just to give you an example, this is a uh, prediction of animal models in terms of bioavailability of drug versus human, and it's just like they don't scale at all. So it's, there are many reasons why the model's broken. One is it's incredibly expensive. It, it takes $2.6 billion to go from discovery through approval. We do studies with cells and dishes that don't function anything like our bodies. We have to do animal studies to get approved by the FDA, uh, and they take years to complete. They're big ethical issues. In Europe, they're trying to make this, to prohibit this. They've already done that for cosmetics. 
And the big problem is that the results more often than not do not predict clinical responses. The bioavailability was just a great example. And so there's been a search for better lab models that mimic whole organ level function. So when we formed the institute, we have six platforms. I had one. And the one I had is called biomimetic microsystems. And the idea was to engineer microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions, not cellular tissue, but organ level functions for drug diagnostic, therapeutic, development diagnostic and therapeutic applications to meet, meet this challenge. Now the first question is why microchips? Well, microchips manufacturing offers control at the same nanometer to micrometer features, the features at the same nanometer to micrometer size scale that living cells and tissues live at. And starting over uh, 25 years ago, George Whitesides and I collaborated and took a technique that he developed called soft lithography and applied it for cell culture. Here you use photolithographic etching like a computer microchip. Let's say you want to make a pattern of small circles, but then you make a rubber stamp from the, the, the uh, etched surface by pouring a polymer called polydimethyl siloxane, silicon rubber, as a liquid, polymerize it, take it off, and it retain, retains the surface features down to the 60 to 90 nanometer scale. And then you can st stamp chemical inks. We originally did self-assembling monolayers. Now we could do extracellular matrix directly. And with that, we had a series of science papers where we showed that we can control cell growth, differentiation, apoptosis, motility, by how far the cells spread or mechanically deform. George started to take this technique and many others and develop what they call microfluidics, where you have two different channels and you flow fluids through this. And as you see here, it, you only get laminar flow because of the small geometry. Turbulence is a function of radius. So you can put two different dyes, they don't mix. I'm going to come back later how we took advantage of that. But the real idea here is that these are basically microvascular mimics. They're like a microvascular network. So we pulled this all together and we created what we call a human breathing lung on a chip we published in Science in 2010. And the idea here is not to engineer a whole living organ, to, be, to build the minimal functional unit that reconstitutes specific functions. And in this case, it was the air sac of the lung. This is one of the major functional units. You have gas exchange, pneumonia, metastasis, uh, drug delivery. Now the lung, alveolus is a pretty simple structure. If you go to the EM level, you cut it in cross section, there's air a single layer of lung alveolar epithelium, a flexible porous basement membrane, and then on the other side, a capillary endothelial cell, and then you have blood. What this doesn't show is that it's an incredibly mechanically active structure, and we know that the breathing motions, the blood flow, the air movements, are absolutely critical for pulmonary function in humans. So if we were to distill this down to the minimal principles, what we really have is what makes an organ, it's two or, two or, two or more tissues that interface and new functions emerge, often a parenchymal cell and a, and a vascular tissue. Uh, in our case, we wanted to have dynamic flow and we wanted to have cyclic breathing motions. So I'm going to show you a video that shows how this works. It, the, it's the size of a computer memory stick. It's optically clear, made of that silicon rubber. There are three hollow channels, each less than a millimeter wide down the center. The middle one has a horizontal thin silicon rubber membrane with engineered holes in it, and it's coated with extracellular matrix. Then we put human lung alveolar cells on top, human lung capillary cells on bottom. We just recreated the alveolar capillary interface. Then we put cyclic suction through the side chambers, and because it's flexible, the side walls actually distort, and it pulls the membrane and attached tissue-tissue interface at the same degree and rate as when we breathe. We then could put air over the top. We could put medium flow medium with or without immune cells to the bottom and now I'll show you at the end we even have endothelial cells on all four worlds, walls with whole blood. So if this works you should be able to recreate organ level responses. So imagine you have an infection with bacteria. What really happens in your body is they infect the epithelium but the epithelium put out cytokines that there's a tissue tissue interaction at the organ level that activates them to express adhesion receptors like ICAM1 selectins. They pull the circulating immune cells out, they diapodes or cross and then they engulf, and that would be uh, homeostasis. So here is high resolution imaging through the device. These are primary human white blood cells. I know they're fresh. We took them out of my postdoc, labeled them. You don't see the endothelium, it's in black, and the epithelium is on the other side of the screen. So to begin with, it's actually a quiescent blood vessel. The blood, just, the blood cells just move by. But if I put bacteria, now you see the cell, white blood cells are recruited out, stick through ICAM-1 and other adhesins. And you could do any imaging you could do in vitro, you could do in these devices. So I'm going to show you a high image resolution. Here's a white blood cell. About here it's going to find a space between two endothelium. 
It goes underneath, finds the hole with the matrix, invades through, wiggles its rear end to the other side. You can now see it coming out by phase contrast, and I'm going to show you the white blood cells in red because the bacteria are labeled with green GFP, and you now will be seeing them engulfed. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response in real time at high resolution in this little rubber chip. So I was funded at the time to do nanotoxicology, and I was, I'm a cell biologist by training, and I heard that 100 nanometer particles were getting across the blood-brain barrier of seminiferous tubules. It didn't make a lot of sense. And the major entry point is the lung. So we took our chips. We used simulants of airborne particulates from smog that are silica nanoparticles. We use microfluorimetry to measure reactive oxygen species fluorescently as a measure of injury. And what you can see here is interesting. If you have just our tissue-tissue interface without flow uh, and you add the nanoparticles, there's no injury. If you add nanoparticle, if you add flow without nanoparticles, there's no injury. But if you add them together with breathing motions, physiological breathing, you see injury and you induce an inflammatory response to recruit immune cells out of the circulation. Now, we also can measure absorption or bioavailability because we can measure the flows, the outflow of this device. And if we basically have no breathing motions at top and now, and versus breathing, we get an eight to 10 fold increase absorption of the nanoparticles. Now, this is not mimicking physiology, this is a prediction. So we actually developed an ex vivo ventilation perfusion model in the mouse and we saw exactly the same thing. So this was a full research article in science because we actually learned something new through the process. We started to talk to pharmaceutical companies and they said this is great but we're really interested in disease models. And so we basically, and also they're interested in toxicology, drug toxicity, so we hit two birds with one stone by using an FDA approved drug, interleukin-2, which is an intravenous drug, and we in injected it to the vascular channel and then we were able to show that we can induce pulmonary edema, which is the dose-limiting toxicity of the drug, and we can mimic this disease process. If you put the drug intravenously, you can see fluid as a meniscus coming into the air channel, and over four days it completely fills. That's the same time course with the same dose as this drug. We can quantify this, and we found once again unexpectedly that breathing motions are critical for this response. We confirmed in vivo, never known before, and this is important because most patients on a respirator with pulmonary edema are in an ICU, so you could, you could tune that respirator mechanically. But we also, I've worked for 35 years in mechanobiology, and this idea that mechanical breathing motions are important led me to think back what we were doing, and we had found that the fastest signaling response that we could observe when you stretch cells bound to matrix was five milliseconds, was calcium through a, a cell surface transporter, uh, a mechanically sensitive ion channel called trip v4 and I heard that GlaxoSmithKline was working on inhibitors although I heard that the program was kind of not doing well and maybe they'd give me drugs so they didn't fund us but they gave us drug and we tested it and we completely inhibited pulmonary edema in this model they then tested this in dogs and rabbits in a cardiogenic pulmonary edema model and they completely inhibited it and we had back-to-back -back papers in science translation medicine and that drug is now in phase one clinical trials now the other thing is that one reviewer said this paper should not be published because it's too simplified, you don't have immune cells. And the other reviewer said, this is amazing, this is like synthetic biology at the cell, tissue, and organ level. They just showed you don't need immune cells for pulmonary edema induced by interleukin-2, and we got it in. So the other part is you, there are assumptions in medicine that we can actually question because we have control of all of these parameters. So this one model provided proof of principle for a human disease model, toxicity, drug efficacy, therapeutic target discovery, and new drug discovery. And this, I think, changed the paradigm, and there's probably a billion dollars or more around the world in this, in this area now in research. Other companies came to us and they said, this is interesting, but we're interested in the big problems for us are asthma and COPD. They're not diseases of the alveolus, they're diseases of the small airway. So we took the chip, we made it higher, uh, we made it one millimeter high, which is the radius of a bronchiole, a small airway. We took primary human small airway cells, which in vivo look like this. They're called pseudostratified mucociliated. So they have mucus and they have cilia. We put them on the chip for three weeks at an air-liquid interface. You get a pseudostratified epithelium up top, the redder endos at the bottom. You stain for cilia in white and mucus in magenta. Across that whole millimeter, they're highly ciliated and, and mucus producing. And more importantly, they're functional. You could actually see from the side and above, these cilia are moving, and they're moving in a directional way. 
You can then measure mucociliary clearance by putting fluorescent microparticles. And I'm going to show you a movie at real time. And this is muc mucociliary clearance in this device. It's exactly the same rate as mucus is clearing in all of our lungs at this very moment. If you quantify all the, the types of cells and the cilia structure function, basically this is a little living small airway on a chip. We then modeled asthma. By the way, drug companies do it in animals. They use IL-13. When you give IL-13, you see increased goblet cells, different cytokines produced, decreased ciliary beating. You could also, we started to mimic, mimic viral infection on these chips uh, using poly-IC, which is a viral mimic. We didn't have approval to work with real viruses yet. And you could see the difference between what people do when they put cells or tissues on a chip with microfluidics versus organs with two different tissues. If you have, for example, just the epithelium, you get a low level of these three cytokines. If you have the endothelium, you get a low level of these three cytokines, but together you get synergy. And this is known in vivo because there's epithelial, endothelial reciprocal signaling that amplifies the response, and we can mimic that on these chips. So we started to do viral infections. This is human H1N1 influenza. We could see infection on chips, but to give you a feel of where this, we're going, this is GFP Sendai virus. We've developed miniaturized electrochemical ELISAs that you can do 64 different um, cytokines, for example, coming out, flowing out of the VASCO channel. So what I'm going to show, I'm going to click this, and you're going to see the virus added an infection, and these are two different cytokines where we're measuring in real time what's going on. So boom, sorry, they're infected, and you see IL-6 immediately goes up, but this cytokine rantus doesn't. And now this is going up and down, this is coming up later. Imagine 64 of these. Now you could see what's going on between biochemistry and cell biology within cell cells at the tissue and organ level in a way you could not do in humans or animals. Uh, Cambus Benham went further. He got cells from human patients with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. He made chips three weeks. They look very similar. But if you look at tolar, tolar receptor uh, expression, they're suppressed, which is known to be a part of the phenotype in vivo in these patients. We then did what you, no one's ever been able to do, which is to mimic exacerbations of infection of in COPD, which is what bring patients to the op, to the emergency room. So, usually it's a viral infection, a bacterial infection, or cigarette smoke. So here we use poly IC to mimic viral infection and LPS endotoxin to mimic a bacterial infection. You can see that IL-8 goes up in the patients with a bacterial infection, and MCSF goes up with COPD patients, but not with healthy. And that's specific, there's not differences here. And so we actually discovered a new marker of viral exacerbation of COPD in this study. More recently, he, he developed a cigarette smoking robot. This is a car cigarette lighter. This is a Gatling gun with 10 cigarettes, real cigarettes. It pushes it, it lights it, then you can control the puff interval and frequency and you could deliver whole cigarette smoke right to the airspace of the chip. Usually people do cigarette work with extracts. When you do that, we can show that the COPD chips from COPD patients are much more sensitive to the toxicity effects of smoke. You don't see it in normal. This is cell stress with heme oxygenase. And this is cytokines. There's no increase in IL-8, major inflammatory cytokine, where you see this with COPD patients. We also can do gene microarrays. And what you see here are chips from three different human patients with, C with COPD uh, exposed to smoke. I'm sorry, normal patients exposed to smoke. These are nine or more patients from a clinical study published years ago. The reviewer said, first of all, you can see that in general, the, the low and high look similar across the board, but we have much narrower range of, of variation than the, than the clinical data, and they questioned this. And we look back and we realize that we could do what you can't do easily clinically, is that we have the same patients and we give them a stimulus, in this case smoke, and we see what happens. So we could actually get to cause and effect where these patients may have had different types of cigarettes, different frequencies, what they may have worked on a radiation, you know, a, a mine, radium mine or something in the past. So this is now allowing one to do work in a more rigorous way, human experimentation in vitro effectively you can't do otherwise. We went further, we took the same chip, we made it wire, wider, higher, we put intestinal epithelial cells on this, to and we did peristaltic-like deformations and trickling flow. We used a cell line called CACO2, it's been used for 50 years by pharma for barrier function, came from a tumor originally, but the pharma says they're very poorly differentiated, they hate them, but it's the best they can use. 
They normally grow for form. It takes three weeks on a trans well, and they look like flat squamous cells, but in vivo, they're columnar and they're in villi. In our chip, we take them, we give them flow and peristalsis, and in five to seven days, they spontaneously form intestinal villi. This is on chip. The villi in vivo have, are known to have a particular structure. They have proliferative stem cells in the crypts where they grow, and then they differentiate into four lineages in the small intestine. If you label for DNA synthesis for two hours, their proliferating cells are in the crypts on the chip, and they move up, and we get all four lineages. This is barrier function, trans epithelial electrical resistance. This is three weeks on a trans well. This is five days on our chip, and paracellular permeability on our chip. This is mucus. I'm sorry, this is P450, drug metabolizing activity. Very important in your gut for pharmaceutical companies. Never seen in these cells in 50 years. This is on our chip. And these cells never produce mucus. This is mucus production on the chip. Now, because they flow and mucus and differentiation and villi, we could do one of the more important things we've done, which is we can culture microbiome. We've all heard microbiome is like the major paradigm shift in medicine, but it's all done by genomics where we can say there's differences in microbiome, but we don't understand physiology. Because if you put them on a culture, it's called contamination, they die. But we put them on these chips. We started with lactobacillus GG from yogurt, or if you buy them in your pharmacy as a probiotic, but it came from human gut. If you put it on a trans well, in one day, it's contamination, you lose barrier function. Put it in our chip for weeks, and you get better barrier function, which is why people take probiotics. We then have expanded this to, uh, we published eight different probiotic microbes, and they just live happily in between the villi and the, over the crypts, and they're in a homeostatic balance for weeks. If you do gene microarrays across 22,000 human genes, if you have put these cells in a trans well the way they do it in pharma, in duplicate, and you compare it to the gut chip, they're totally different cells across 22,000 genes. If you now add microbiome, they're totally different cells again. So there are no bad cells. I always say there are no bad cells like there are no bad kids. They get in with a bad group of friends, but maybe you can bring them home if you bring them in the right environment. And if you do gene microarray analysis, they're getting closer and closer to human ileum as, as you move down to the right. We could put enteroinvasive bacteria on it, E. coli, and now they completely overgrow. And we published uh, about a year ago a model of inflammatory bowel disease where we could dissect the contributions of all these different factors. I won't go through all of it, but you can see, if you view from the side the white line of the villi, if you give the invasive bug, you lose the villi, it's called blunting in vivo, and you lose barrier function, the red line here. If you give a, a endotoxin at the bottom from E. coli, no injury, no loss of barrier. But now if you circulate immune cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, now you combine the endotoxin with the immune cells, you completely lose it. Now we are collecting cytokines, and we could actually ask what's coming out of the lumen, what's coming out of the capillary. None are coming out of the lumen. We looked at 12 cytokines implicated in IBD. And you can see here, only when you get injury, you get four cytokines, IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha. And we can measure the concentrations. So now we can go back. And we could add one at a time, two, three, and four. And it turns out only that combo of four do you get injury. So we're beginning to dissect the combinatorial control of biological responses. I went to med school. And in med school, when you have a patient on uh, well, medicine, if you have a patient who gets anesthesia, if you've ever had surgery, they want to get you eating as quickly as possible so you get peristalsis back, or else you can get ileus. Ileus is uh, overgrowth of the bacteria. And I always wondered, like, why is that? You know, you still have openings at both ends. And in the medical literature, they assume it's decreased motility, leading to decreased fluid flow. But I'm a mechanical person, and I thought, well, what about the peristaltic deformation? So on our chips, we could continue fluid flow, but stop peristalsis, and now you get small, you get uh, bacterial overgrowth. So it's actually the mechanical deformations that suppress, physiological peristaltic deformations that suppress bacterial overgrowth. We've just developed uh, what we call a kidney glomerulus on a chip. We had to develop uh, our own way to make iPS-derived human podocytes. We put them on one side. We have human glomerular endothelium at the other. We find that only when you give one beat a second of deformation, similar to what people have visualized in glomeruli, you get foot processes go through the pores to the basement membrane, and you get glomerular filtration rates that are similar to that in vivo. Finally, I told you we now are culturing cells on all four sides of the endothelium and all sides of the vascular channel. And so you basically have a real capillary blood vessel on the bottom. 
And so now we can put whole human blood with no anticoagulants. This is for 20 minutes just flowing through on the endothelial side. A lot of people have used microfluidics to look at clotting. So this is collagen on a surface with fluorescent platelets. And it's well known that you get clot formation in vitro. But you'll see here that the platelets bind and stick and you get a clot. It's sort of static. If you have an endothelium above it, it's, it's protective, anticoagulant. This, the blood just flows by, as I showed you. If you use an inflammatory mediator like TNF-alpha, you get a clot. But notice that that clot is moving. The platelets are adhering, de-adhering, adhering and de-adhering. And this has been known to happen in vivo, never seen before in vitro. So if you quantify that in colors, this is the turnover at the front end and the back end. We collaborated with Bruce Fuhrer. Bruce we made a clot in vivo and quantified it in vivo, and we see the same shape, this teardrop shape, and the same dynamics. So we've now been modeling pulmonary thrombosis on this chip. And first thing we did, just one example, we took endotoxin that in vivo, if you give endotoxin into lung, you get pulmonary thrombosis. And if we add it to the airspace, we get pulmonary thrombosis. But if we add it directly to the endothelium, we don't get thrombosis. And we've shown that it induces the epithelium to put out cytokines that activate the endothelium to express adhesion molecules, that pro-inflammatory molecules that, that mediate clot formation. And uh, this model is actually used by a pharmaceutical company that has a drug that failed in human clinical trials because of blood clots in the lung, never seen in any animal model. So now they can't go back to an animal model to figure out which drug to bring up. And because we can mimic it here, now they could use this to go back to the FDA and choose one that would be less toxic. So I summarized this last year in a, in a mini review in Cell, where it's basically, it really is synthetic biology at the, at the cell tissue and organ level. You could start with just, let's say, the intestinal epithelium, see whether you mimic human physiology. If not, you could add the endothelium. If not, you could add immune cells. If not, you could add normal microbiome. If not, you could add infectious pathogens and so forth. Then we're integrating dendritic cells and, and M cells into the gut. And um, you could put fibroblasts. But it allows you to, to learn things about how each individual cell or factor contributes mechanical as well as gradients, hypoxia. We could do all of that. So to pu pull this part of the story together, we've got at least 10 to 15 different chips. Kit Parker has been working uh, she was, when he was there, heart, uh, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, brain chip, which are basically human neuronal cells. Um, and uh, years ago, I had a review where I suggested that you can imagine creating an integrated human body on chips. Because we have blood endothelium lined blood vessels, we could connect them. So you could put an oral drug through the gut, transfer it to the liver, see whether it's metabolized, peed out by the kidney. Do you have heart toxicity? What does it do to bone marrow? Or aerosol drug to the lung. And uh, amazingly, DARPA came out with a grant announcement using that picture in their announcement. And the challenge was to build 10 different human organ chips and an automated instrument that can mimic how functionally linked organs respond to drugs in the human body for, to predict pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And so we did that. We proposed 10 organ chips, an instrument that would automate their culture for a month, and then use, uh, develop some computational models to extrapolate PKPD from that. I can just tell you that as of last fall, we have done eight organs for three weeks on an automated instrument. We actually use robotic samplers to fl transfer fluid because there's too much dead space and it's too rigid a connection through tubes. Uh, we've done gut, liver, lung, heart, kidney, skin, blood, brain, barrier, and brain. Uh, and uh, we're now moving to 10 for four weeks because that's the goal, goal of the grant. But we have been able to show that we, you can't see all this, but we can maintain functionality of these different organs. We could also have developed models for PK and show that the, the, the numbers we get out very nicely measure, measure the models. And we're extending this uh, uh, enormously. I think the game changer here is like right now, big pharma and biotech, they spend millions on development, billions on development, but tens of millions on clinical trials. They'll often do a big clinical trial and they almost always fail. Then they have statisticians who number crunch trying to say, is there a genetic subgroup that maybe responded better? And then if they find it, they'll do a small targeted trial. And if they're lucky, they get approved for a narrow application. With IPS technology, induced pluripotent stuff, you can imagine, let's say we had a woman middle-aged Hispanic women with uh, COPD who are ultra-sensitive to cigarette smoke. We get 
make 100 chips from those women, we develop a drug that's really effective for them, and we use those women for our small clinical trial. I think that's going to shorten the time, decrease the cost, and increase likelihood of approval. And, and I think that, you know, this is where the hope lies. Now, that's just one small thing we have going on at the, or at the VIS. And so I want to give you some other examples of bio-inspired technology. And this is mostly stuff I've been involved with uh, for clinical medicine. So another big high-risk problem, high impact is sepsis. Major killer worldwide, 30% mortality, um, big cause of hospital deaths, and increasing antibiotic resistance worldwide. So many years ago, I suggested the idea of developing what we called a, a, a dialysis, a biospleen, a dialysis-like ther sepsis therapeutic device. It would be like a dialysis device. Blood would go out of a patient, go through this device. It would capture both living pathogens, dead pathogens, which are the toxins that cause the inflammatory cascade, and then cleanse blood would go back to the patients. The idea of microfluidics with laminar flow, I thought, well, we could have blood and saline, they could flow by each other without mixing, and I could pull things out bigger than a dialysis pore, like whole cells and pathogens. And then it was, how would we pull it out? And I had worked with magnetic beads for years on mechanotransduction. So the idea we had was shown here. You could have two channels. We would basically have magnets on one side. We would have saline on the top. We would have sterile saline. We'd have whole human blood you're going to see in the bottom. Here we have magnetic beads that are fluorescent. The magnets up top, if they bound pathogens, they would be pulled up through the pores, and the cleansed blood would go back to the patient. And this actually worked incredibly well. But the problem was 70, over 70% 70 of patients with fulminant sepsis are blood culture negative. You never know what the pathogen was. So you can't like have an antibody to E. coli to do this. So when we started the VIS Institute, I mentioned we hired people from industry, and one was Mike Super, and he had worked in inflammatory diseases, and he had worked in drug biotech uh, therapeutic development. I said, do you know, in med school, I remember there were things called opsonins, which are our primitive immune system in blood that bind many different pathogens, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have a specific one to look at. I said, do you know of any? And he said, well, I did my thesis on mannose binding lectin, and so this is one of the most ubiquitous opsonins. And these are components that are lectins that bind to surface carbohydrates that are on uh, non-human cells, essentially. And, and mannose binding lectin actually binds to gram-negative and positive bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, endotoxin, and many other toxins. And it normally activates complement and coagulation, and that could actually induce the sepsis cascade and inflammation. So Mike, being a biotech person, he genetically engineered out the bad parts, the complement activation, coagulation. He kept the carbohydrate recognition domain. He put it on an FCIgG domain, which is what pharma does to stabilize therapeutics for injection and also its quick purification. And so we made what we call FCMBL. And we basically can show that it binds all three pathogen classes. If we put it on magnetic beads, we could pull down gram positive, gram negative, and fungi. And in fact, We've now confirmed, and the red is what we've done, the white is from the literature. All of the species of fungi that exist, we combined, most, almost all gram-negative, gram-positive, viruses including dengue, Ebola, influenza, HIV, SARS, parasites, uh, tuberculosis, uh, toxins like uh, endotoxin, LTA, et cetera. It works equally well with antibiotic-resistant bugs. So we developed our own rat ICU, we put it on this little dialysis-like device where the blood goes out to a pump. We have the mag magnetic beads in heparin, put it through the magnetic separator, and the cleansed blood goes back. And when we gave endotoxin a lethal dose, they all die in four and a half hours, we can save 85% of the animal lives putting them through this device. We also had done e, e. coli as well. Now, we then, we were, we were funded by DARPA, but we had a partnership through DARPA with the FDA and they said, uh, this is great, but you know, you have magnetic beads that could leach into the body. Uh, we talked to investors, they said, that's really expensive. And so can you simplify it? So we said, well, let's just put it on a commercial kidney dialysis membrane for hollow fibers. We immobilize it and we actually get nice uh, cleansing of pathogens. And we actually see synergy when we use antibiotics because antibiotics kill the bugs and release the fragments that we capture. And so uh, all I can say is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the name of the company, but that's being commercialized and it should be in human clinical trials by the fall if all goes well. Now, 
I mentioned one of the big problems in sepsis is the diagnosis that 70% of blood culture negative. So because we can capture the bugs without knowing what they are, we developed a simple ELISA-like uh, assay where we took magnetic beads with this molecule. We, kept, we t mix it with blood. We then use a sandwich with another MBL that has horseradish peroxidase and, and we read whether it has these, the, it's called PAMPs, pathogen associated molecular patterns. This is the pathogen and associated molecules. And we can show in pigs in a, a sepsis model that blood cultures get negative within 10 hours after injecting bugs, uh, but there are still bugs in the body and we could detect that. Uh, and it, tra it, score it actually is more of a, it travels with the white blood cells which can measure whether it's live or dead. And then we did 150 human patients at the Beth Israel Hospital. Uh, this, and we could show that blood cultures as expected, only 18% could you detect that they would have sepsis, and this is done retrospectively, we could detect 85% of these patients, and the specificity was 89, similar to blood culture. And so this means within one hour, you could say whether or not to triage a patient because they actually have sepsis. It could be in doctor's offices. Okay, another example of the VIS is that when we formed, we, I really argued that this should not only be medical, it could be non-medical because there's, there are things in the non-medical world, manufacturing, aerospace, energy, that could be useful in medicine and vice versa. I literally formed a company in 1998 to do 3D printing of medical devices because I saw 3D printing from aerospace prototyping that could be used for med medicine. Now that company died with September 11th, but now it's happening, maybe too early. And so Joanna Eisenberg heads a platform where they're working, she was working on materials that would prevent ice from sticking to airplane wings. And she looked to nature, she looked, to a, a plant called the pitcher plant in Africa. Pitcher plant, when it's dry, insects crawl all over it. But when it gets wet, it gets a very slippery surface and you'll see in one second that the ants just slide into it like a black hole and they actually eat them. It's like a Venus flytrap. And she figured out why this works and it turns out there's a nano, a rough surface with nano topography and it holds a thin layer of liquid. And so she made artificial nano fabricated substrates and you can see now you put ants on that and they, they get very humiliated and that they just sort of slide right off. And then she can make one of the most sticky things in the world is crude oil. And here you can see that the crude oil just slips all over it. But more importantly, it's a self-healing material. You could cut it with a razor blade and the fluid just flows back in and it still is non-sticky. And she won the R&D award in 2012. She formed a company called Slips based on this. And so we tried to use this because DARPA wanted us to do sepsis therapy with microfluidics without anticoagulant because soldiers have so much injury they can't give them heparin in the field. And so we tried this and it worked, but if any of this leaches off, you get procoagulation because rough surfaces stimulate clot formation. So we wanted something that would work with medic existing medical grade materials, medical devices, and we developed what we call a tethered liquid perfluorocarbon. Perfluorocarbon is biocompatible, they were developed as artificial hemoglobin, and that's what, the perfluorocarbons is what uh, Joanna was using in her surfaces. And what we do is we co chemically, covalently link a perfluorocarbon that's hydrophobic, and then we put a liquid perfluorocarbon, and it holds it due to hydrophobicity, but the outer layer is flowing, so it's almost like a lip liquid bilayer, if you like. And now the blood liquid flows by this perfluorocarbon liquid, and there's no interaction. And so if you take medical grade, this is acrylate plastic. If you put fresh human blood, it, as expected, it clots right away. If you coat it with the simple coating, the blood just beads right off. Hopefully you'll see that. Yeah. We took a, a arteriovenous shunt from the hospital. It has three different medical grade materials, polyurethane, polycarbonate, PVC, and we coated it with this. And then we put it in pigs without any heparin, and we had no coagulation for eight hours. And this is the cover of Nature, uh, Nature Biotech. So this is just another example of where you would never expect it, something from the, the non-medical world impacting medicine. And now, as a Harvard faculty, I have to disclose that I have formed three companies. Emulate is not the latest, it was the first. Um, and Opsonics was formed to do the sepsis therapeutic device and companion diagnostic. Free flow was just formed to do the non-stick coding and I hold equity and chair the scientific advisory board so you can't believe anything that I say, so you can ignore everything, but most of the data occurred before the companies formed. 
I'll end with one last example I said to programmable nanotherapeutics. Dave Mooney heads a platform called, that was called Programmable Nanomaterials. The idea was to create smart medical nanotechnologies to go from implantable medical devices to things you could inject through a needle. I worked on drug delivery for cardiovascular medicine because, again, looking for like what are the big problems, think of like what are the major causes of death, heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis. They are almost due, all due to vascular occlusion, almost most due to, due to blood clot. And so the question is, I, there are great drugs out there that are thrombolytic drugs like tissue plasminogen activated, TPA. If any of you have had a relative who had a stroke and they got him to the hospital really quickly and they gave him this drug and it was completely reversed, that's a thrombolytic drug. The problem is that only 4% of patients are eligible to get that. Four, that means 96 can't get that. And it has to be given within three to four hours after the patient has the stroke. And so the idea was it's a great drug, but it has dose-limiting side effects is bleeding into the brain, bleeding distally. So what if you can give that drug at an incredibly low dose and only deliver it to the clot site? That would, you, know, you may be able to give it in an ambulance, for example, without knowing uh, what's going on. So we thought, well, how would you target a drug to a blood clot? And we thought, well, what's different about a blood clot? Well, you have a narrowing of a blood vessel. That causes high shear stress. It's a mechanical change. And so we thought, well, how would you target things to a region of high shear stress? And we thought, well, platelets do that. That's why you get a, 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 a stroke and a heart attack. Platelets are activated by high shear to stick. So we, we basically took uh, FDA-approved nanoparticles that are made out of PLGA, a, a drug release polymer suture, suture material, 180 nanometers. We use a technique that pharma uses for aerosol-based delivery called spray drying. And we make a clump of these that's about three microns, which is the size of a platelet. You can think of them like a wet ball of sand. If I take sand and it's wet, I could shape it, it's round. But if I shear it in my hands, it falls to grains. And so the idea as shown in this video is if you have a, a clot, you can inject peripherally in a vein. These would travel around like a platelet. They would, they would do nothing until they saw high shear. Then they would deploy into small nanoparticles, which have lower drag force, and they are coated with something that binds fibrin, and so they would stick and they would degrade. And if a bit of the clot leached, they would keep traveling with it and degrading it. So we developed a model in a microfluidic of a clot and added these, and you could see they dissolve it just as we expected. And then we developed an, an, a mouse model. Oh, boy. Wow. I'll just say we developed a mouse model of pulmonary edema uh, that, um, that basically 85% of those animals die within um, four hours again. And with one injection, after the clot injection, we saved all those animal lives. And so uh, that's something else that works. We've also showed it works with st stroke in combination with medical devices there. So let's just go here and see if this works. Yes? OK. So. Um, and so basically, that's all of them died, and we get 80% survival. And if we pre-dissociate the nanoparticles and give nanoparticles, it doesn't do that. So basically, to end, when we formed the VIS Institute, we said that we were going to develop, create a new engine for develop bio-inspired bio materials and devices. And what we found is that we actually developed a new model for disruptive innovation. We've had one science or nature paper every month since we were founded eight years and three months ago. We've had 1,800 patents. We've had 18 startups, another 10 uh, licensing deals. And so uh, to end, just there, you know, to do this, we need people from every discipline working together. The organs on chips, Kit Parker is a co-PI on the DARPA grant. Um, on the TLP, I mentioned Joanna as well. Um, and, and I think this is the future to really bring about transformative change. You really have to bring about people from different disciplines. We're all excited about the same problem, but none of them can solve it on their own. With that, I'll say, uh, invite you to the website. We won the Webby a few years ago for the best science website. We beat out Wired Magazine and NASA Space Propulsion Lab. We actually got bored, so we just put a, a new one. We're actually a finalist for the Webby again, um, but I invite you to it. I, th I think you'll enjoy it. So with that, I'll end. Thank you so much. I'm glad we got through the technical. I'm happy to answer questions. So, oh, yes. I, I got one here. Question? Hey, yes. Uh, professor, thank you for your fascinating talk. Two questions. Number one, when you say it's mechanical, as far as uh, you know, 
say the microbe going through the lungs, is it due to a change, a cyclic change in the stresses? So when we saw the change in absorption of nanoparticles in the lung with breathing, there's no change in absorption of albumin or dextran. So we're not opening junctions. I think what's going on, I have no proof of this, is that we're actually increasing uh, paracellular transport. So the, the, we're increasing the uptake of these particles by the epithelium, transcytosis, and, and they're basically exocytosing at, at the bottom, going through the matrix, taking up at the bottom of the endothelium through the cell and being spit out at the top. It's not opening junctions. The second question is regarding uh, the microbes in the brain. You explain up to the lungs. How does it get into the blood-brain barrier? How does what get into the blood barrier? The microbes across the blood-brain barrier. Um, I don't know how microbes get, we're talking about nanoparticles, I don't know, but we have a blood-brain barrier now on chips where we use human, iPS-derived human brain endothelium, and we have human in vivo level barrier function, so one could explore that. We haven't done that yet. Yes? Do you think the body on the chip platform could be adapted to model cancer metastasis? Uh, yeah, so we what we're doing now is what we call orthotopic models of human cancers. You know, in animals, like, they found much better results if you take a mammary tumor and you put it in the mammary fat pad or a prostate in the... So we're now putting human lung cancers in lung chips and liver chips as a metastatic. And, uh, and we've put in grants where we talk about, you know, looking at the cells that come out and seeing if it passes to others, but we haven't done that yet. So, so as I said, the great thing about that is the question was, would it, the last one, would it run the, the, the risk of leaching the clot and causing a stroke? So this is bound to the clot because the TPA binds fibrin. So we have found that if the clot leaches off, it's still degrading it at a distant site. So it would work anywhere once it's bound to it. Um, and. Uh, but, you know, the existing technology, like the, right now in stroke, they have a device called the Stentriever, and they just pull a, put a wire through, and like a rotor rooter, they pull it out, and they're, they're happy, patient goes, but then, you know, if you look at distal parts of the brain, there are all these little clots at those sites. So we, and they also reform again quickly. We published a paper in stroke where we could add this with that, the Stentriever. We just put a wire through, we don't pull it out, and you make a little hole, a little hole is high shear, and we actually get the clots to clear that way as a more general way. Yeah. Um, you talked about organs on a chip becoming a platform for personalized medicine. Yes. Um, what time frame do you see for that happening? Because there's huge obstacles for like implementing that on like, a, at a hospital or a small hospital. Well, it's incredibly expensive, right? Um, but the, one of the investors in Emulate and the founding of Emulate is Cedars sinai Medical Center of Beverly Hills, California. Okay. And they invested in the second round, too. And they have a lot of money, and they basically have been collecting, doing whole genome, GWAS, and IPS on every patient that comes in. And they were going to use IPS to do drug screening for personalized medicine. Then they saw how, how the high level of function we get, and, that, and they, they, so they bought the company. I mean, they invested in the company. And they already have beta testing machines there. They're not doing it with patients yet, but they already have made chips with cells from patients with genetic abnormalities in the brain area and, uh, and blood-brain barrier and have some really interesting results. So uh, sooner than you may think, but for a very small group of people, I fear. Do you think drug companies would be interested in, like, I guess, targeting their products to people instead of how they do it now with large cohorts? You mean my idea of small groups? Yeah. I don't know, but they, they're enormously interested in these chips. I mean, you know, like... One thing that when we were at the VIS, we had some collaborations with Pharma, who now moved to emulate, but the, the, one of them was to, they said, can you make a dog liver on a chip, a rat liver on a chip, and a human? Because every drug company has to do toxicology in rats and dogs, and they get completely conflicting results, and they have to wing it. You know? And then they'll do human cells in addition, they're totally different. So they, um, with emulate, they now are opening their you know, their archive where they have drugs that they know the results in dogs, rats, and humans because they went to the clinic. And uh, I haven't seen the final data, but it looks promising. But if it works, that would be a game changer because then every pharma would want to do that because it's not only human, but it's interpretable and predictive, right?
Let's have the dean yep. thank uh, Don. <coughs> so, Don, congratulations. I'd like to offer a small token oh. of appreciation from the College of Engineering. So, thank you for visiting the university and um, again, congratulations. Thank you thank so you. much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.